Good afternoon and welcome. I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, my name is Brian O'Kennedy. I'm the Managing Director of Clearstream Solutions uh, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, the title of our webinar today is Shaping Your ESG and Sustainability Reporting Journey uh, and Staying Ahead of the Reporting Curve, which is an increasing challenge for us uh, as we see many new initiatives and frameworks and standards and regulations emerge in this ESG and sustainability space. Um, for today, we have a very exciting agenda for you, a very tight agenda. So um, uh, just in terms of what we're going to cover, uh, my colleague Shane McGann is going to take us through uh, the uh, reporting overview. So uh, a sustainability reporting, all you ever wanted to know about ESG standards. Um, and then George, we're delighted to be jo joined today by George from GRI, the Global Reporting uh, Initiative, uh, which has been a leading light in the sustainability framework strategy for over 20 years now. So delighted to have George along today. Uh, and then um, typically the highlight of all of these sessions is when we get to talk to the practitioners themselves. And I'm delighted to say today we have Susan McGarry, who's the Managing Director at Ecosam Ireland, and Uti Marn, who's the head of sustainability reporting at Smurfit Kappa, uh, two uh, organizations that it's fair to say are at maybe different uh, stages of maturity in their responsible uh, business journey and reporting. So it'll be very interesting to hear from them as to how they're, they're managing that, that journey. Um, when we started Clearstream about 12 years ago, I remember talking to the head of CSR in a very large uh, uh, financial institution about their sustainability report. And um, uh, she proudly announced that they, well, they, they, they had done the sustainability report for their employees. I was, I was noting the fact that there were very few KPIs in the report. Uh, in fact, there was a significant lack of KPIs, but lots of nice pictures uh, of the employees participating in various CSR events. Uh, and I suppose, to be fair, back 10 years ago, that's what a sustainability report probably looked like. Um, the expectations and uh, requirements now of ESG reporting are a lot more rigorous um, and there's expectations uh, are, are a lot clearer uh, and more succinct. So we're going to hear a lot about that today. At Clearstream, when we're asked uh, to help companies with the sustainability reports, like all good consultants, we'll come up with a, a six-step process. Um, so uh, you can have a look at this afterwards, but essentially like any change management process in your business, you've got a plan for it. So you need to set out from the beginning, understanding what your goals are. You need to engage with your stakeholders, define your key KPIs and then measure. A measurement is obviously key. Uh, and then the only then and the, do you get to look at the different frameworks and how you might lay that out. So we always suggest that companies start with the data and build up uh, and then before they consider how to publish their, their final report. Um, in terms of sustainability and ESG topics in general, it's a very, very wide subject. So for the, the, the business people, and I, I sympathize with the likes of Uti and, uh, uh, and Susan, who are trying to grapple with the whole range of different topics that are out there. We have general sectoral issues uh, that we need to take into account. Um, we have general economic issues and, and uh, societal issues. We have sectoral issues in our own business. And then we have specific issues relating to our organization. All of these are relevant to our ESG reporting. And we need to put these through some form of a prism. And typically the prism is one where we re review the impact from both a stakeholder's perspective and from an organizational perspective. And that defines obviously the importance and criticality and what is typically called the materiality of the issues that we're looking to. So this is how companies assess um, the relevance and key prioritize the significance of these issues. And many of you on the call will have carried out various types of materiality assessments. So bringing all of those wide subjects through our business and stakeholder prism and prioritization into our final sustainability report. Finally, uh, just a, a few words we, we again would recommend to people that they keep in mind when they're developing an effective sustainability story in their report to keep the following items in mind. So first of all, very critical to, to be able to talk about your organization's commitment. Transparency is key. I always look for uh, challenges, organizations that are prepared to talk about the issues and challenges that they're having, not all the wonderful stuff that's going really well. That's key, that transparency. 
the legacy, what are we leaving behind us? A critical, important part of any sustainability or ESG journey is that we consider the legacy. Monitoring progress, KPIs, builds that credibility and authenticity, a key issue and a key word for us in our ESG journey, authenticity. And finally, the report needs to be accessible and increasingly accessibility means that it needs to be in a digital format that can be screened and scanned uh, for various by various content and, and sustainability ratings and other organizations who are reading our reports. So even if we think that there's no audience out there, there are organizations that are out there looking to screen and uh, assess our sustainability and ESG performance. So that's by way of introduction. I'm gonna uh, now hand over to my colleague Shay, who is gonna take us through the latest frameworks and standards. And there's a lot happening, obviously, as we know at EU and other levels. So uh, Shay, over to you. Thanks, Brian. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Shay, and uh, as Brian said, I'm responsible in Clearstream for sustainability strategy and reporting. And I'm just going to take you through um, the reporting landscape today. Um, the jigsaw that is the global goals and principles, reporting frameworks, ESG ratings and indices and regulation. As Brian said, it's a really busy and noisy space and it's constantly evolving, um, which makes it really confusing for, for many companies to know where to start and to, to select the frameworks they're going to align to. So starting off, we've got the, the global goals. And I think the most common one here are the sustainable development goals. Then we've got the reporting frameworks. And there should be lots of logos you recognize here, GRI, SASB, CDP. There's the supplier platforms like SEDEX and Ecovatus, and also the more traditional ISO standards. Then we've got ESG ratings and indices, um, and they're um, measuring corporate's ESG performance. So they're taking all the information that you feed into those reporting frameworks and they're, they're creating investment products products with that, with that data. And then finally, we have regulation. And um, this is, this is e EU regulation that's um, driving ESG integration. So the Corporate Sustain Sustainability Reporting Directive, um, Mandatory Climate Risk Reporting, the EU Taxonomy, and the Sustainable Finance Disclosures Regulation. I'm just going to go into that in a bit, bit more detail now. So um, what's been happening in the last year and, and, and what progress have we made towards a global corporate reporting system? There's been a lot happening at both a global and an EU level. I think there's clear ambition to try and make it easier for companies and to, to, to bring sustainability reporting in line with financial reporting. Um, sorry. So from a global perspective, I think there are just key, uh, three key um, elements I've pulled out. The first is um, the, the work that the, the five main voluntary reporting organizations started last year with their shared vision. So that's GRI, SASB, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, CDP and the International Integrated Reporting Council. They announced the shared vision to work together to achieve a comprehensive corporate reporting system. And they outlined this approach in, in two papers they released last year. Then we have the um, International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, and they released a set of core and expanded stakeholder capitalism metrics. And these were supported by 120 of the the world's biggest companies um, to, to, to kind of improve the consistency of reporting and to be able to track their progress against the SDGs. And then finally, we have the Interna International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, and they launched a consultation process last year on sustainability reporting, and they're now working towards establishing an international sustainability standards board and to achieve um, a comprehensive co corporate reporting framework with sustainability standards. Then from, from an EU perspective, again, lots going on. Um, it's just finished, it's, um, it's uh, I suppose just to say firstly, it's very much aligned to what's happening at a global level, but they are pressing forward with um, increased mandatory sustainability reporting for companies operating in Europe. 
They've just completed their review of the non-financial reporting directive. And that this has been replaced with a proposed corporate sustainability reporting directive. And just a few key elements of, of this new directive. Um, it's going to cover all ESG topics. And will require um, companies to, um, to consider double materiality. So not only will you have to look at um, how your, your company impacts on the, the wider society and the environment, but you'll also have to look at how sustainability issues impact your company. It's going to apply to a much wider pool of companies, so all large companies and some listed SMEs. There'll be, they'll introduce assurance requirements, and they're also going to support the shift to digital. So, so tagging of sustainability information will be required in your reports. And then they expect that the companies will publish their reports in accordance with the standards by 2024. So we'll see the first reports then. And then finally, just to say that um, this, this regulation complements a whole range of other um, reporting regulation that's, that's coming from the EU at the moment, like the EU taxonomy regulation and the sustainable financial disclosures regulation for financial market participants. And then finally, from a national perspective, this, this new regulation, it won't be required to be transposed by member states, it'll be directly applicable. And the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment um, launched its, uh, its um, public consultation on the directive last week, and it's open for stakeholder uh, res responses until June 23rd. So um, I'm just gonna go with, through a few, few of the, the main frameworks. Um, just in the interest of time, but uh, as you start to get into like e each sector, there are, there are even even more. Um, but this should this should be a good start. So, firstly, you've got GRI, um, and GRI provides companies with a set of standards to report their ESG information to all stakeholder groups. It's a holistic approach to reporting and strives to provide information in a um, in a way that's comparable and emphasizes transparency and accountability. It requires companies to conduct a materiality assessment to identify the topics that are material in their business. Then we have SASB, and they provide industry specific standards. There are 77 um, sectoral standards in total, and they help companies select the topics that are likely to impact the financial performance of their business. Um, so instead of um, looking at how the company impacts on the, the wider environment in society, it, it, it's looking inward um, on how sustainability issues impact the, the, the company. So both GRI and SASB, the, the standards are, are free to download from, from the website, so there's no scoring or cost. Then we've got CDP, and uh, CDP is the global platform for environmental disclosures. And this is done through a number of questionnaires on climate, water and forestry, and it offers companies the ability to benchmark themselves against their peers. Um, so there's a, there's a scoring process and because of that scoring process, there is a cost and it also has a really good um, supply chain program. Uh, then we have the SDGs, so I'm sure you're all familiar with, with uh, these. They're a broad set of 17 goals that were originally meant for use by countries and cities. However, there's been a big uptake. Um, of them, the use in the business community, as they're really good for engaging with a wide range of st stakeholders. Um, below the 17 goals, set 169 targets. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how companies track against progress, progress their progress against these, these targets. And there's more and more guidance emerging on how the different frameworks link to the SDGs. Um, then we've got the TCFD. So the TCFD provides guidance on how to disclose the impact of climate related risk on your business. It help, helps companies report on governance, strategy, risk management, and kind of gives tar metrics and targets you can use. And this guidance is, is incorporated into lots of the other frameworks like GRI and SASB and CDP. So if you're using those frameworks, then you're, you're kind of automatically aligning, aligning to the TCFD. Then we've got the UN Global Compact, and this is a voluntary initiative or kind of like a CEO pact, and it, um, it aims to help companies implement 10 sustainability principles in their business. 
and they cover the top topics like the environment, human rights, labour and anti-corruption. And it also requires companies to do an annual progress update um, each year. So there's no, no, no fee for smaller companies, but there is there's a fee for large companies. And then finally, there's the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. Um, and this is a, another reporting framework for environmental information, but it's wider than climate and kind of includes natural capital. So then just I'm just going to leave you with a couple of um, nice graphs that I think really help people kind of put the different frameworks into, into perspective. Um, this plots the prescriptiveness of the, the, the frameworks and standards against the, the scope. So you'll see down in the, the bottom left hand corner, you've got GRI. Um, it's got a really broad scope as in that it includes environmental, social and governance. Um, but it's got a somewhat flexible approach in that you do a materiality assessment so you can pick the topics that you that you want to report on. And this is in contrast to CDP, which is up in the, the top right hand corner. Its scope is, is narrower, so it's just environmental. And because it's a, a questionnaire, um, it's, it's, it's much more prescriptive. And finally, um, I took this graph from the Climate Disclosure Standards Board because um, I think it gives you a really nice idea of how the, the different um, reporting frameworks fit together and how they're all like how it's kind of fitting in with financial information. So you'll see on the right hand side, you've got GRI and that looks at um, the impact a, a company's activities are having on society and the environment. So it's, it's got that really broad range of sustainability disclosures. Then you've got like SASB and the CDSB which are a, a smaller subset, and they look more at how sustainability issues are impacting the company. Then on the right hand side, you've actually got the normal financial reporting. And then the little roof on the top is the, the integrated reporting um, framework, which, which tries to bring um, sustainability information together with financial information in your, in your annual report. So I hope that provides a good overview and you can take some of those, those graphs away. And uh, I will now hand over to George, who's going to get into all the detail of the GRI standards. And just before um, it, we hand over to George, just to mention and thank you, we already have a number of questions coming into the chat box. So keep the questions coming. Um, some really good questions. Uh, so we will be back to those. So keep the questions coming in the chat and uh, feel free to turn on your cameras, but we would we would prefer that if you can mute yourself as well, please. So thank you. George, welcome. Thank you very much, Brian. And, and thanks, Shay, for that great overview of the landscape and a lot of the components that I think definitely need to continue to be clarified um, to help support organizations looking to respond or report these things. So I'm very honored to be here. My name is George Harrington. I am a manager in our corporate and stakeholder engagement team, which really means that I get the opportunity to speak to a very broad group of our stakeholders uh, around the world, and specifically in Ireland, the UK, France, and, and Italy at the moment. Um, so I have the opportunity today to speak to you a bit about GRI, as well about the standards, our core product, and hopefully be able to answer some questions that, uh, that you may have. And if not, then we can certainly find time to answer those if we, uh, if we do run out of time. So I'll try to keep to the clock, Shay and Brian. So um, I'll get started quickly. So as a quick update and on a quick background, let's say on, on who GRI is. So we are an independent organization and, and we really pioneered the idea of sustainability reporting, as Brian mentioned earlier, about 20 years ago. And we now offer really the global disclosure framework that helps support companies to be more transparent about their sustainability performance, as mentioned already by, by Shea, on the external area. So on the environment, on the economy, on society. Um, we really look to help any business. So irrespective of where they are, their size, their sector, disclose these impacts um, and also provide those really relevant insights for company and their stakeholders. And this can help inform you know, decision-making and improve the environmental, social, and as well financial outcomes. A little bit of a, of a roadmap here. So we started back in, in the late 90s and it was really born out of this need for transparency. And there was the Exxon Valdez disaster that I think brought a lot of things to light. And so people wanted to demand for corporate behavior to really be scrutinized and, and obviously improved. 
So this kind of began the journey and through it all, uh, we have in 2016 launched what is our core product and uh, the free public good, which is the GRI standards. Um, and as well, you can see the more of the recent history. It's been a great journey of bringing in um, the stakeholder input and making sure we maintain a, a very relevant global framework. A resource here that I'll let you go into in your own time, but it, it does show uh, a bit more of insight on the most widely used standards for sustainability reporting. So both for new reporters and uh, let's say leaders in this space. So it's uh, done by KPMG. It was conducted a survey and they've been doing this, I think since 1993. So a long time that they've been looking at, at this and seeing these trends. I um, mean, the latest edition published in the last year looked at 52,000 companies in 52 countries. And again, uh, you can go into a lot of the detail there. I think from our perspective, what it showed um, and highlighted for us is that 80% of companies worldwide are now reporting on the idea of sustainability. And then again, from GRI's perspective, among that 80% uh, that were surveyed, you know, GRI came out as still as the dominant global standard uh, for the sustainability reporting. But again, the link is on this slide. There's also, I've been told, will be shared uh, as well. So you can uh, go into that and find lots of these nice takeaways as well as takeaways on SDGs and, and other reporting areas. But I'll now go a little bit into the standards themselves. Really a key to the standards is our approach to it. And this is what's been al allowed to really make the standards resonate and be as robust as they are. And that's the multi-stakeholder approach that we apply. And that means we bring in the inputs from a very large range of constituencies, including civil society, business, investment institutions, labor, and media institutions. And this approach really ensures that we have the participation and the expertise of the broad stakeholder group that uh, really exist in the world of sustainability. And that helps in the development of the, the GRI standards. It's also important to mention that the body responsible for updating and, and maintaining the GRI standards is called the Global Sustainability Standards Board. And there are independent standard setting bodies. So they're able to run this uh, process very thoroughly, very transparently in the, the public, uh, for the public good. For those of you that have not seen it before, uh, the GRI standards are really made into a, a modular set that you see here, which include the three universal standards on the top and 34 topic specific standards, which uh, I'll go to in a moment. But these are publicly available and free. And as, as Shay mentioned in her overview, I think what's really important to note with this is to look at this broad range uh, that was mentioned. And yes, this is a very busy slide. I'm not gonna go through each one in a lot of detail. But a lot of the times when people see this, they ask kind of where, where do I begin? How would I even get started in this space? Or I'm a little bit lost as I try to figure out these things. But if I go back a slide, the, the simplest answer, um, and just if you want to explore this a bit further, is in, in the 101 series. And that lays out some of the key principles of sustainability reporting. And there's, there's 10 of them. Um, again, due to time, we will not go into all of these in, in more detail, just mention a few in highlights. But I think what this highlights to me and what the important thing to remember is that sustainability reporting is a process. It's not a tick box exercise. It's not there to, yeah, just be something that you do and then wait for the next year to come around. It is a process and through following the principles outlined in the process, I, we truly believe that businesses can understand their impacts and have a, a real crack at, at making those uh, more positive and working on that balance as well on, on identifying where there may be areas for, for improvement. But the materiality con uh, concept is a very key one uh, for, for GRI and all of the, the standards out there, and as mentioned by Shea as well. And for us, that uh, materiality is requiring organizations to consider their full impacts on the wider world. So rather than solely focusing on perhaps the financial impacts on the business itself, which are still important, but we also make sure that they're considering which of those uh, impacts are happening on the environment, on the economy and on society as a whole. So this is really a, almost a complementary, and, and we're very excited that there has been a move towards more mandatory disclosure on this space and a discussion about bringing the parity of 
not only financial materiality impacts, but also sustainability impacts. And as Shay said earlier as well, it's that balance of making sure you get to understand both sides of the impacts that you are having as a business externally and what's happening externally is impacting the business. So it's very much a, a key element of it. Again, these are all gone through in much more detail. Um, I, I mentioned balance is my favorite because a, a key part, and some people will say, well, what's, what's uh, GRI doing letting companies greenwash? Well, it's not obviously what we do. We don't allow companies to do anything like this, but it's through the principle of balance, which requires companies to really look not only at the good things they're doing, but also to understand and talk about some of the things where they need to improve. And that balance, I think, really drives even more meaning to these reports. And um, so again, more detail on a lot of these areas, but that's one that I, that I like to focus on. Some of the benefits, well, I think uh, ones that we like to mention is that the benefit for new uh, reporters and leaders in this field is that they do integrate uh, and reference global policy. So governments and market regulators do use uh, the GRI standards who reference them. I think at the moment there's uh, the carrots and sticks uh, resource and there's 168 policies in about 67 countries that reference or require the use of, of the standards. And that's because of that modular structure which allows these regulations or these public policy bodies to reference specific areas of the standards. Um, secondly, it is that you know, flexibility and the ability to be uh, future proof. And so again, that modular structure allows us to update specific standards each uh, time it becomes uh, up to its turn. And also in line with you know, world uh, developments and changes in, in the landscape, uh, as was mentioned earlier as well. And um, so it's, it is again, that modular structure that, that plays a big part here. And before that, so if you look back on the timeline, when we had to update the, the guidance, it was a big project and everything would be reviewed and updated at the same time. Whereas now we can maintain and update a bit more specifically as well as making sure we uh, yeah, respond to what our stakeholders need a bit more quickly. Another benefit obviously is that they do represent that global common language. So the GRI standards is one common framework that can meet all the reporting needs from you know, comprehensive reporting issues all the way to topic specific disclosure. So it's not only the, the what, but also the how to, to do this. And the fact that sustainability reports based on the standards uh, can be used to benchmark organizations uh, to each other and performance concerning you know, laws, norms, code, codes, performance, um, and all of these voluntary initiatives as well. But lastly, the, the standards are developed with that credibility and robustness as a key part of it, and that's through the GSSB, which I mentioned, and through the transparent process of developing the standards. So um, I think one of the areas that is most important uh, to the development of a standard is the public comment period. And that is when the uh, project working group full of the experts and topic uh, specific players in the space, they put out a, a draft of a standard and this can be looked at by all stakeholders everywhere in the world and they can provide their feedback, which is indeed incorporated or reviewed before a standard gets released um, to be used. So again, that applies to that space. So speaking a little bit of the kind of uh, latest or revised GRI standards on where, where we're going um, as a standard setter. So the first one, and I guess one of the most important ones that, that's going to affect all companies that use the GRI standards is the revision to the universal standards. So because the universal standards do apply to all organizations using uh, our framework, um, the, the update to this is going to have a very su substantial, um, let's say an important change. We're bringing in new and important requirements on human rights on due diligence reporting, as well as aligning more even further with the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines. Um, so there's a lot of information on this. You can see the revision standard if, if you do like on our website. We're currently past the public comment period and that standard is going to be, I think, launched more or less around October, November this year. Um, so an exciting space, but also important to note that for those that are just starting to report or maybe in their first year or two of reporting, not to worry, it doesn't mean that when this is launched, it's going to 
make you have to change everything right away. There is a lead time to understand these changes. We we'll have lots of support and resources that, that do that. And I know our members will be well informed as well at Clearstream to ensure that this transition happens uh, as smoothly as possible. Another exciting development is the, yeah, the first GRI sector standards. So as imagine, and as been asked for a long time, the different sectors have different impacts on the economy, on the environment and society. So for this reason, we launched um, a few years ago, a big effort to really offer more standardized reporting on sector specific impacts. Now these are all supposed to be used together. It doesn't replace the, the standards or looking at your materiality, but it can be used in conjunction to help inform what your stakeholders can expect from, from your reports. And the first one that's gonna be coming out later this year will be in the oil and gas sector. And we also have a public comment period starting in, I think actually this week uh, for the agriculture and fishing sector. So that's one where if you're interested or you know someone that's interested, you can still definitely get involved in that space and also get an idea of you know, what these will look like. And this infographic here, I should say, this gives a bit of an idea of what, what that will be. So it is the universal standards that can be used um, with sector standards to help identify some of the material topics but also to make sure that you're using the identified material topics through stakeholder engagement to, to report on those uh, as well. And this slide really just talks a little bit about uh, some of the areas where we are already aligned. So they also add to that robustness of us. So that includes the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the ILO conventions and the OECD guidelines for multinational businesses. Um, I think what's very important also for us, um, and again, going back to Shay's slides where it showed a number of the players in this landscape, is that the standards are compatible with a number of these already. And that is either through linkage documents directly um, or through, uh, let's say, the publication with SASB that we did uh, earlier this year, which shows how organizations can report with both because we understand that there is a demand coming from businesses stakeholders specifically investors for that SASB information and so we are working with them to make sure that uh, we don't create even more work for reporting organizations but that organizations that are using the standards can easily find that narrative to also talk about their uh, SASB disclosures. Another resource that I think is uh, always interesting uh, to talk about is the really three publications we had on reporting on the SDGs. Now, this is something we did with UNGC um, to really find out and, and introduce this idea of reporting on those. They were set at a state level, and now obviously there are a lot of buzzwords in to how businesses can work towards that, how different institutions can work on that. And so these three publications really do outline how business can consider to do that. And um, so the first one is the analysis of, of goals and targets is very much a, a thick dictionary of all of the goals and all the targets. So again, an interesting read perhaps, but um, also you can find which ones and you can go through and identify which ones maybe are more interesting to, to your organization. Um, and then there's the practical guide, which gives you kind of a step-by-step -step process on, on how you might do that. And from our perspective, if you're reporting with GRI and you want to know maybe which SDGs you do have an impact on, if it's not already obvious, or then you can also li link your material topics to SDGs and specific targets. And similarly, if you know some SDGs that you want to work towards, well, this document allows you to understand which disclosures you can use to report on your progress uh, or impact towards that. Uh, the third one is, is really looking at what investors are asking for when it comes to reporting on SDGs. So again, bringing in that lens uh, and making sure that companies can, can discuss that. Uh, finally, a quick slide um, on some of the areas that we do look to support because we understand that the standards are a very big resource. Um, the one that I think is always, and the really reason, reason I'm here is the GRI community and, and Clearstream's a, a member. I mean, it brings together organizations around the world who um, not only use the GRI standards, but that uh, understand the importance of, yeah, transparent business and sustainability reporting. We have a number of services that also support specific areas in a reporting organizations, either report or the process. We have some reporting tools you can find on our website and those are softwares uh, that uh, allow or support specific areas in the reporting cycle. And then also training and, and coaching, which we use certified training partners and our GRI Academy, 
to uh, to really bring and increase the, the knowledge of reporters uh, around the world. But I think with, with that, um, I will say thank you. Um, I'll take a little sip of water. And I don't know if I'm opening now for questions, Brian, or if it's uh, um, at the end as well, timing wise. Uh I think I think we'll we'll come back to you. We'll include you in the panel, George. So please, when we get to Q and A stage for the panel, uh, do have a couple of questions that have come in already that I think you'll be able to contribute to. So thank you very much for that. And as I said, yeah, as you mentioned, at Clearstream, we're, we're very proud to be a member of the the GRI community. And certainly, both ways, um, it's it's a it's a very valuable resource. So I'd encourage others to consider it. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we certainly find the engagement from GRI uh, and with GRI very useful. Um, so now I'd like to welcome our two practitioners, um, the panelists, and these are the people who go through the, uh, the practical pain of, of managing this wide, broad uh, ESG reporting issue. So uh, I'd like to welcome Susan McGarry. As I said, Susan is Managing Director of Ecosem and Uti Marin, uh, who's the Head of Sustainability Reporting at Smurfit Kappa. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Susan. Um, so I think it's fair to say, if you don't mind me, that you're mind me saying so that you're at a relatively early stage in that journey uh, around reporting, but maybe just firstly around around Ecosam, because I know as a company you're hugely committed to sustainability and climate, and your products are all about decarbonization. So maybe a little introduction to yourself and Ecosam, and then where you are on your reporting journey. Yeah, and um, thanks, Brian. So um, I'm the managing director of Ecosam Ireland. So we are part of the wider Ecosam group, uh, the parent company's Ecosam Materials. Where it's a, it's an Irish company, but we've got plants in France, in the Netherlands, and then import terminals in Sweden and the UK. Um, our main product is ground granulated blast furnace slag. So it's a bit of a mouthful, GGBS. It is a byproduct from the steel industry, and it's basically used as a partial replacement for ordinary Portland cement. Um, so cement is a particularly carbon intensive industry. It's um, responsible for about 8% of global CO2 emissions. In Ireland, the cement sector is responsible for 4% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. So it's quite a big chunk from one industry. Um, so the use of GGBS, um, it's used mainly for its engineering and technical benefits to um, lengthen the lifespan of concrete. Um, but also uh, a lot of the time now, more so because of its environmental credentials, because it's seen there's a UN report and um, there's many, many expert reports on this, that it's the best available technology for lowering the embodied carbon of concrete. There's very little else currently available that, that can decarbonize the cement sector um, as much as clinker substitution. So clinker would be the main um, constituent of cement so that's what you dig out from the ground burn at very high temperatures and turns into into your cement so by replacing some of that clinker um with a recycled material like ggbs you're um, making a direct impact to the carbon emissions of that sector and um, the cement sector is trying to decarbonize at the moment they've got a, a european roadmap um outlining how they're going to get to net zero emissions by 2050 and a large part of it is reliant on carbon capture and storage and green hydrogen coming online we don't know if that will be the case by 2030 but we do know that there's immediate savings that can be done right now in this decade using clinker substitution so that being said that's what ecosem is all about we sell a low carbon product we try to influence change within um, the cement sector um, and the wider built environment sector and um, because from our market-based emissions point of view we're making such a difference it's important that you also look internally and the the driving kind of phrase behind our reporting was our business process has to match our business vision and we weren't exactly doing that like we were doing a lot of good things but it was kind of scatty and all over the place there was no formal structure and um, so my role before um running the Irish business was the group sustainability manager and um, that role was created because I said we need to do this, we need to do some reporting, we need to get some structure around it. Um, it took a huge amount of convincing at the time um, that you know are we, do we really want to put out so much public information like we were in a very much a growth phase um, and there's rapid expansion plans, new technologies, innovation, all that, do we want to put a lot of that information out there? Um, and thankfully they let me run with it um, and so I kind of started this journey in 2018 based on 2017 um, information 
um, and had initial um, chats with Brian, but because it was kind of new, I didn't get a huge amount of investment for this. So it was like, do it kind of as best you can with little to no budget. So a few little consultations with Brian, he gave me the best guidance he could. Um, we aligned with the GRI as much as we could without going with GRI. Um, we did our materiality assessment, which was fairly limited. Um, I think we only had a couple of external stakeholders involved. And we produced our first report in 2018. It was called Vision 2020. So I was kind of giving myself sort of a three year space to see what we could do. We'd always reported to the Carbon Disclosure Project. That was one good thing that we were always doing, but it wasn't a really um, planned out response, you know, pulling together everything. So we took a year out um, and we then applied last year. And um, with the help again of Clearstream, we would said, look, we want to take this seriously. We should be an A-rated company and, and we should be a global kind of thought leader like the other A-rated companies are. Um, and we moved up from a D to a B in one year, which showed how much actual work we were doing that we weren't reporting on or capturing. And um, so thankfully then, because of the success of that first report, um, it was like, well, this is now, this is our practice. We now do this reporting. It's now been used to um, gain investments, to um, improve kind of any sort of funding. A lot of the finance stuff, because we're in this growth phase, we're hugely into funding, grants, all that kind of stuff. And the sustainability report has been used in all of those meetings. Um, we've recently had a 22.5 million euro investment from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is the Bill Gates founded um, fund for low carbon technology. All of that is it's based not only on our product, but on who we are as a company as well. And a lot of that is to do with the fact that we have a coordinated approach to um, our sustainability strategy and that we're reporting on it in a very clear and accessible way. So now, so I feel like I'm taking up the whole kind of chat here at the next stage, as you said, we're very much at our early stage. We're now moving into the more kind of sophisticated level of reporting and hopefully we'll, we'll kind of match Uti's level of, of <laughs> disclosure at some point, but we're going to align with the, we're going to do the GRI reporting rather than our own kind of voluntary report. We're going to do it through GRI and um, keep chasing our A rating in the carbon disclosure project, set science-based targets around our carbon emissions. So it's really to formalize the structure now at this point. Susan, thank you. That's, uh, I'm sure a lot of, uh, let's say, people who are at early stage will have found that fascinating. Um, and I think the, the progression and the journey that you've been on is refreshing that you took those baby steps um, and, and, and started out and got confident and got good and now ready to move on to the next phase. So, so well done. I know you, because it's a private company or has been, you know, you're, you're not necessarily, a lot of this is um, off your own path that you've decided to to voluntarily put yourself forward as self-selected. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's fantastic. Um, and now maybe to the other end of the spectrum, I mean, I don't want to set you up, OT, but certainly 11 years reporting GRI, um, you've had a phenomenal CDP response. Uh, I, I give the Smurfit uh, report is a case study in, in best practice. Um, but I know there's a journey here, right? So do you want to take us back? Because you've been doing this for some time uh, and maybe your role and, and sustainability at Smurfit. I know, obviously, we're very proud of Smurfit in Ireland, the Smurfit Kappa uh, and, and your Better Planet program. So uh, i give you an opportunity to discuss that too. Thanks, Brian. And um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, yeah, Smurfit Kappa is a, is a 46,000 employee company with 8.5 billion euro um, turnover last year. And uh, we produce annually about 13 million square meters of paper-based packaging <laughs> and other solutions for our customers. So that's uh, Smurfit Kappa in very nutshell, uh, leading in Europe and leading in those markets where we are in the Americas as well in, in, in cardboard packaging. Um, Smurfit Kappa has been reported in, uh, in sustainability from 2007, uh, 2007 and uh, soon after we started reporting, we went into, into uh, following the, the GRI standard. Um, and when I joined the company uh, in 2014, um, we moved uh, at that time from um, uh, core to comprehensive reporting. 
in uh, in the standards that <laughs> that was available then, <laughs> and now we are comprehensive standards. Uh, uh, so so that's what we do. Uh, that means that we do very thorough DRI reporting at Smurfit Kappa, um, and that's practically part of what we want to do. And um, if I if I say something about what sustainability means for us, it is actually we we call it end to end. Uh, sustainability and it means that everything uh, what we do from sourcing our raw, mat raw materials producing our products and the product being actually uh, sustainable um, and we do this also by by taking care of our people our communities and at the same time uh, uh, striving for the best possible governance so it's kind of a very holistic program that we do also very typical for Smurfit Kappa that we want to tick all the boxes so uh, that's kind of uh, the thing for us. Um, in paper sector, uh, sustainability has been quite important for quite a while. So not only that we, we are a publicly traded company, we, we also are in the sector where you have had certain pressure of reporting and, and paying attention to sustainability quite a while. Uh, Smurfing Kappa may be a little bit less than some of the competitors, but um, nevertheless, it, it is something that the industry alone and the sector alone has to pay attention to. So that's, of course, drives in the background. Um, in principle, um, reporting is, or good data and transparency is a huge basis for us in, in uh, how we build our sustainability strategy and nowadays also a huge part of our uh, company strategy itself. Uh, we want to know what we are doing and we want to be able to measure it and we want to also offer to our stakeholders and especially our customers, investors, something that they can practically have a tangible touch on. So uh, measuring yourself well is, is, an, is a key. And I think that um, their following a standard helps you to uh, develop the systems. And we have actually rather developed internal systems of data collection. Some of them are very leading in the, in the sector as well. And um, that gives us a good insight. And we have now uh, over, over 12 years of really robust data that has been assured for us for those 11 years. So it is, it is a good basis and it gives us credibility and confidence to talk about sustainability. Um, so we are already quite advanced as, as said, but I wouldn't say that this is not a learning curve all the time. A, the standards are changing all the time a little bit. There is always a new tweak in there. There are new things that the stakeholders are asking for. So that's something that um, keeps us at least <laughs> <laughs> and you can't kind of just uh, feel secure that you are doing things well because you need to be um, uh, going with the with the trends and and the change. Um, I would also say that um, doing this focusing on sustainability reporting, uh, even though it is so, we kind of separate our story and then the the then the um, statutory disclosures so that those go the statutory stuff goes also into our annual report now but then in the sustainability report we have the opportunity to actually really tell the story of the company as well and that's a nice thing that sustainability reporting gives to you as well because it is like Brian in the beginning said it was pictures of people doing CSR <laughs> and that was the, the report so it is it is a way of, um, and it is a topic that um, has an emotion in it. So it's, and it doesn't, it hasn't started with the legal base like uh, financial reporting. So the, the way how you build your report is very different, even though there are standards and there are shared um, um, opportunities or shared um, 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 targets in the, in the background. And I think that uh, being at this stage, you kind of uh, focus on a bit different things. It's not no longer only about focusing on getting all of the data that you need behind you. It's also about how you tell it, 
uh, it's about how you limit your stories and how you evidence it in, in increasingly um, growing, uh, for the increasingly growing demand. So those are maybe those things that I would say are different from just still continuously needing to be learning something. Also, when you are um, following the DRI standard, for example, and you are assured like we are, uh, we have a limited assurance, uh, but for all of the data in our report, it is that um, first you go into the big chunks and the auditors look at how, how you deal with that. And um, we are at the stage where we sometimes think that why are we looking at this thing? Because all the big picture is anyways fine. So it gets smaller and smaller and more detailed all the time, which is in its way a big challenge as well, because you, you need to be able to respond um, into more and more detailed questions and, and strive, uh, strive for transparency in there as well. Good. So I think uh, that's in short where we are. Uh, it's our 13th or 14th report actually. Um, this year, the 2020 report, and we did a big, big change in it um, during the, the reporting season. And I'm happy to uh, open that one up a little bit more, but I'm sure that Brian comes to those, those details in his questions. Yes, I, I'd like to come back to you on, on a couple of topics there and, and that some of the questions have come in around materiality and also um, uh, maybe the assurance piece because you've been through the process. But maybe, Susan, I'll just coming back to you and, and maybe building in uh, into one of the questions that was asked, because I know you did in some way build in the SDGs into uh, into your report. And, and I guess Gronia has asked us a question about, and, and it was Shay during the, a couple of weeks ago mentioned this wonderful topic. Well, it was a word called rainbow washing. I hadn't heard of it before, but essentially... It's this idea of just splashing the SDGs, all oh, throw them on the page there, they look great, um, without really understanding what's happening in the background. Um, and, and companies just reporting the positives without reporting the negatives. So maybe just talk a little bit about the SDGs and, and then we can touch on this on this question of, of, uh, of, of companies just uh, you know, using SDGs without fully understanding the targets. Yeah, so we, we, as I said, our materiality assessment at the beginning was limited to all of our internal employees. So everyone completed it and then a couple of uh, customers and clients. Um, from that kind of, we, see, we saw kind of common trends between what, what people considered important and what was important to kind of general society. We grouped those um because we're if this is this was a voluntary report our first one we're like how are we going to do this so we decided to group them into kind of core category areas and then kind of did a review of the sdgs and said okay like we we tried not to do the rainbow washing great phrase and we're like well what ones what sdgs can we actually work on within those categories of issues that that we have of importance and that we can work towards changing. So that's as far as we went. Um, and in terms of the good and the bad, that was very difficult, like say the second year to be like, okay, so we didn't perform in some of the areas, but we're out there now, you can't not do it. You gotta say, I, I, we didn't do what we needed to do. Um, and that's fine. I mean, the world didn't fall down around us when we said like, we didn't achieve this target. Um, so in terms of transparency, we've, we've tried to do that. It is a difficult thing. I think it'd be easier if it was in a more structured way in the GRI way, because it's like you either did or you didn't. Whereas we could have been like, oh, we just won't talk about that target anymore. Or we just won't talk about that sustainable development goal. Whereas we try to kind of the, the moral side of you're going to do this once you've put the report out there and said, these are our targets, these are the core goals that we're trying to trying to work towards within that, you're going to have to follow through on it the following year, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. Just put okay. it out there. So that's I'm probably not the best one on the sustainable development goals because we have, that's as far as we got. It wasn't a huge amount. 
Yeah. Well, your your employees will be the first ones to to notice there's a, if there's a difference between what you're telling the world and what you're doing in, internally. So, um, uh, and and Oti, I know uh, you you mentioned you, you uh, guys report the the SDGs as well. If you've if you've a thought on that, but I, I'm also interested in in your materiality approach because I think you've quite a comprehensive. Uh, you know, is that do you recommend you start with a small number of of material issues or should you take the whole lot on and 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 figure out what's important to your business well i think actually it's very interesting uh, combination the sdgs and materiality i think they go some sometimes hand in hand as well and what i really like about the gri and i saw there there was a question about the difference between gri and SASPI. one of those things is that um you have to do your own uh, materiality assessment in gri when you follow gri but when you follow SASPI, you have to follow the so they made the sector uh, materiality assessment for you. So um, for us at Smurfit Kappa, for example, uh, actually making your own materiality assessment and renewing it certain, at, after a certain period is, um, is a very important uh, step. And, and um, from the reporting perspective, I think um, materiality, first of all, it helps you to know what you need to do and that is the way of not rainbow washing your stuff so uh, that's that's keeping it at line and and and, and uh, not trying to go everywhere um so we've done um different types of materiality assessments and um we we have had uh, different ways of uh, engaging with our stakeholders to do that so uh, if i tell you what we did last time maybe that's the best way um, we actually engage quite widely um, with different areas uh, in the materiality assessment and for example um, we um, structure it so that you do first kind of a desk study uh, of all kind of documents and questionnaires and stuff like that that you can study on your desk uh, practically to understand what actually shows you already what the other people are interested in your company. But at the same time, you are all the time following what the company itself does. So you take your strategy, you take your vision, you take your products, you take your production um, uh, units, and you, you look what actually happens in there. So those are the core things that uh, matter. Also your location geographically, because some of those things that might look really fancy and nice don't apply to you because you are not in a place where it's an issue. So that's one thing. Then, um, and, and in this, we have also legislation. We have uh, questionnaires like C CDP or other ESG questionnaires. And we also look into the GRI already at that point as well. Um, and then it's the other area, which is uh, kind of taking it live. And that is um, how, how we did it is we had um, two questionnaires. Um, we asked our employees what they thought is material to the company. And then we also uh, surveyed a bunch of our key stakeholders, mainly uh, customers, suppliers and uh, investors, and asked what they think uh, is material and what they would like to know about Smurfy Kappa in our sustainability report. So those uh, questionnaires gave us um, data that you can also um, kind of work into a numeric uh, tables and, and start to get some, some balance on, on things. And then we stress tested and that practically a discussion between us and top management where we think we are and where we should be and how we see that all this data that we have gathered through these two different assessment uh, types uh, takes us. Okay. You cannot really not take into account what the, what the uh, desk study and the the surveys give to you, but you can move certain elements a little bit here and there. Okay, uh, and I, I think what that what that suggests is that you own the process yourself and just build it build it bottom, take in all that feedback from everyone and 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 create it your yourself. There's no you know there isn't one best practice solution out there that just fits everyone. I think that's a that's a message, and and I guess that adds authenticity right. and 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 re reality to it. Um, yes. I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm just going to very quickly go through. George, I want to give you one minute just to 
Uh, any advice, somebody starting on the GRI process, what, what should they do? I think a quick answer, I think we'd start with, with 101. And I know that sounds very basic, but um, I, I think there you'll, you'll get an understanding of, of what's involved and, uh, and how to get some of those core principles down. But um, yeah, event, attending events like this certainly helps, right? Getting the practical experience from people that are doing it is uh, so. Feel free to reach out to Odie and Susan. I'm offering their time for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, last, last one for you. What, what's next? What's the challenge this year that you're going to deliver on, on your sustainability reporting? Um, so we skipped last year's report due to COVID. That's the benefit of voluntary reporting. We have flexibility there. So we're going to cap off our vision 2020. Um, that should be out this, this summer. We we're kind of targeting June, July. So that'll be 2019, 2020's data. And we've done a huge overhaul on how we even monitor and measure our carbon emissions. We are hopefully doing science-based target um, commitment as well this year with the view to setting that actual target then hopefully next year. Um, so our next stage for carbon for sustainability reporting will be a net zero roadmap, I reckon. I think that's where we're, we're going, but there's a lot of that going on in the construction sector with, I don't know how much substance behind it. So we're trying to do it right. Uh, hold back on just launching something and trying to do it right first time. Yeah, yeah that whole net zero um, carbon neutral out by 2030, 40, 50, whenever is really driving significant change. And that's going to be, we're going to have to report against those metrics. So um, OT, your last, what's what's your, your big challenge and push now what's what's keeping you busy on the reporting front um well i think we did a big push uh, in the last report where we really uh went into this, um fine-tuning our storytelling so that was a really big thing and we also included um the, the T, uh, tcfd and SASB reporting to our dri based report but then the next thing is again that now that we focus on the story. The next challenge is going back to the back to the data and and the disclosures. So we are going to go through our report and find the gaps that we, where we are not so great yet. So that's uh, that's then the next thing. And we are looking into the SBTI, which is not easy at all. I can tell you that. Um, uh, so that's that's what we are focusing on. Uh, I think the next round uh, and keep keeping the quality because we've reached really a good point now. Um, so so now it's also the challenge is to actually stay there, <laughs> which is not cool. always so easy either. Yes, the bar is being constantly raised. So um, thank you all very much. I promised we'd finish on time and there's another broken promise. I've, I've run a couple of minutes over. Um, we have so many questions coming in. So apologies, we didn't get to them all, but we will respond. We've had questions on assurance. We've had questions on, on incorporated. We dealt with SDGs with questions on the number of issues to report and, and then the link between GRI and SASB. So we'll try and get to those. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to come back to us or indeed any of the speakers. Uh, to my colleagues, uh, Shay and Gronje, who put on a great show today, thank them. And to all the speakers, Oti, Susan, uh, and George for being with us. We will definitely have George back again to do more GRI stuff. Um, and so all of you, thank you for joining us. We will be sending out the recording and keep in touch and stay safe. I got my vaccine today about two hours ago. So for any of you who are worried about the vaccine, uh, it works, it wasn't painful and uh, I'm still alive. So uh, good luck and stay safe and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care everyone. Bye. Thank you.